which economic textbooks are we reading, you know? I mean, we have an economy that tells us it's cheaper to destroy the earth in real time than to renew, restore, and sustain it. You can print money to bail out a bank, but you cannot print life to bail out a planet, right? So at present, what we're doing is we're stealing the future, we're selling it in the present, and we're calling it GDP. We can just as easily have an economy that is based on healing the future instead of stealing it. We can either create assets for the future instead of that, stealing it. One is called restoration, the other is called exploitation. And whenever we exploit the earth, we exploit people and cause untold suffering. And working for the earth and working on behalf of humanity is not a way to get rich. It's a way to be rich. It has been said by many that we cannot save the planet unless there is a widespread spiritual awakening. Well, would we recognize one if it happened? Probably not. Maybe we're in one, and we don't know it. In The Great tra uh, Transformation by Karen Armstrong, she details the origins of our religious traditions in the actual age, 200 to 900 BCE. And during that time, there was a great, great teachers arose you know, with a tremendous amount of insight and intellect. So Socrates and Sophocles and Lao Tzu and Confucius and Mencius, Buddha, Rabbi Hillel. But these people did not create religious institutions. They were heading social movements. This was, <laughs> this was about changing how society was organized. This was very violent in barbaric and cruel times that they lived in, right? What they taught did not require belief. It required action. They were not trying to create doctrinaire institutions, right? But a compassionate society. And they asked their students to question and challenge everything and to not take anything on faith. In other words, ask, you know, speak truth to power is what they were teaching. They urged people how to change, how they acted in the world, you know. And they relied on two common principles, which is life is sacred and the golden rule. Never, ever do anything to anyone that you would not have done to yourself. Rabbi Hillel's famous commentary in the Torah said, don't do anything to your neighbor that you wouldn't do to yourself. This is the Torah. Read it. All the rest is commentary. That's it. <laughs> right? When a biological system starts to falter, the way to heal it is to connect more of itself to itself. We know this from ecology, right? Well, think of what we heard on the panel of texting, of instant messaging, of social networking, emailing, right? This is a system connecting more of itself to itself. This is a clue. Youth know this cold. But whether it's an immune system, whether it is a social system or an ecosystem, systems require intricate webs of interconnection and collaboration to be resilient and vital and to heal. And we network this world as we're doing in this conference so that we can see, know, and reimagine ourselves. You know. Ralph Waldo Emerson once asked a very important question. He said, what would we do if the stars only came out once in a thousand years? Just once. Well, we wouldn't sleep that night, <laughs> that's for sure. We would probably create a dozen new religions. <laughs> We'd be ecstatic and happy and delirious. We'd be dancing, there'd be music, celebrating the glory of God. Instead, the stars come out every night, and we watch television. <laughs> this is an extraordinary time we live in. It's not historical, it's civilizational. We are globally aware of each other and of the multiple dangers that threaten civilization. This has never happened, ever, 
in the history of the earth or in the history of humanity. The generations before us did not stay up all night. They got distracted and lost sight of the fact that life is a miracle every moment of our existence. To be sure, hope has to pass a sobriety test and walk a fairly straight line to reality. But remember, hope only makes sense when it doesn't make sense to be hopeful. As the last election proved, the most realistic person in the world today is the dreamer, not the cynic. This movement is the hope of the world, concern for the well-being of human beings is something we are born with. It's innate. It's in every one of us. We have to be educated out of it, not into it. We become human by serving others. And what it takes to arrest our descent into chaos is one person after another remembering, really, who they are, where they are, and joining together to save and restore life on Earth. It is such an honor to be here with you today, to celebrate you, and I just want to say from my heart to yours, thank you very much for what you do. In my heart, you are not the unsung heroes. You're sung. Thank you so much.